Glory be to Jesus. Oh. All right, so um, thank you for coming. Um, we started talking yesterday about the resurrection life. But if you listen to yesterday's lesson, there is nothing in it that talks about the resurrection life, right? I say it may not make sense until we get to Sunday. That is on Sunday. Um, before we get into the nature gritty of the resurrection life itself. Um, so we'll spend quite a good time on Sunday talking about the resurrection life. But tonight I want to continue from where I stopped yesterday. Um, you know, so I began to speak to you about how that sin came into the world and how that the work of Satan can be disguised in the ordinary course of life to bring about sin in, in, in someone's life. And I give you the example of Peter. I gave you the example of Eve. So tonight we are going to take it further from there. And Father, we ask you in the name of our Lord Jesus, receiving the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Father, that our life will manifest the glory in Christ to the honor of your name. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Say amen. Hallelujah. All right, so we saw sin came into the world and death by sin. And I told you that don't ever conclude in your mind that sin comes because, purely because God allowed sin. You know, because I've asked, I've heard that question many times. People say that if God knew that the men were going to sin, why did he, why did he create a condition in which they would have sinned? You know, um, and that is pretty much charging God with what you call you know, that God is guilty of creating, if you create the environment of sin, that means you are guilty of making them sin. Are you following what I'm saying? So you find out that um, it's a very difficult, um, it, well, it's not so difficult, but I, sh I showed you James chapter 1, right? Verse 13 to 15, and I showed you how sin is formed. And what does the Bible say? In James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15, let's quickly go there. James chapter 1, verse 13 14 and 15. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Uh -huh. Neither tempt he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and is what? Enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, that is when it is completed, bringeth forth death. So, what leads to sin? Is it God who creates the environment, the atmosphere for sin to thrive? Or the lust of the heart of a man? The lust of the heart of a man. I told you the word lust is a longing. A longing. Usually for something that is forbidden. You know, what you have been told not to do, then your heart begins to desire for it. For instance, God told the woman, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good, of the fruit of the knowledge of good, of the, no, the, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? This is in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then the woman began to lust after the fruit of that tree. Are you following now? She began to lust after it. She, okay, if I eat it, what will happen? Will I really die? And that was why Satan came in and said, ah, what did God say? you will not surely die. See, Satan played on the lust of our hearts. See, are you following what I'm saying? Satan does not just come into your space. You must give him a foothold. That's why the Bible says, don't give place to the devil. Are you following what I'm saying now? So you must create, you, for someone to fall into sin, the person must have created an atmosphere for sin. So he says, don't give place to the devil. So you see that now, lust is the reason why people sin. Okay? And the seed of sin is lost. Right? It is lost. Now, so Satan will hide behind the desires of men to strike with sin, deceptively driving mankind away from God. And you know, if you look at the story of Eve, that was exactly what happened. You see, Satan was able to hide behind our lust. You see, to perpetuate his own work of deception. And then at the end of the day, she, he was able to draw the man, the woman, away from God. You know, for that moment, the woman stopped talking about God. She said, no, 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 leave God, leave God, leave. What did God say to you? 
Oh, what did God say to you? Right. So, I said, Satan hides behind the desire of men or desires of men to strike with sin, deceptively driving mankind away from God. So, now, so the, the idea of Satan is to take people's attention away from God. Are you following what I'm saying now? What did God say to you? Did he say, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Why would God say they should not eat of every tree of the garden? Don't forget, they will take their food from the trees of the garden. So, the question is a fishing question. Okay? So, I know God did not say that. God says we can eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that is in the center of the garden, we shall not eat of it. This is for in the day that we eat of it, we will surely die. And then Satan says what? You shall not surely die. In other words, God does not know what he's talking about. Are you following what I'm saying? So what is the immediate implication of this conversation between Satan and the woman? You know, there are things that you easily observe in that story in Genesis chapter 3. You know, and first and foremost, Satan is not daft to deny God. Right? Did you notice that Satan did not deny God? He says, what did God say to you? Right? As God said, you should not hit of every tree of the garden. Are you following what I'm saying? So even Satan is not daft to claim that there is no God. So this idea that there is no God today, where did it come from? It certainly is not from Satan. That's why the Bible says, it is a fool that says in his heart, there is no God. You see. It's a fool, a fool that says there is no God. You know, how do you tell Adam and Eve that there is no God? They met him. They spoke to him. He gave them the garden. Adam spoke to him one-on-one. -on -one. Are you following what I'm saying? One-on-one. -on -one. How do you not tell that person that there is no God? You see, it would be very silly. So rejection of God is foolishness, not Satan. And of course, you know, Satan will be glad to use extra resources. If somebody says there is no God, a human being says there is no God. You know, God, you know, Satan is happy to use that kind of a fellow. Okay, I cannot say that. You are stupid enough to say it. I can use you to win some people away from God. Are you following what I'm saying? And that's what you see in the world today. Why some people claim there is no God. But it's a very stupid argument. All right? Um, in, in fact, not just because we can prove it, because we don't have to prove it. Because, you see, the thing about Christianity is faith. Are you following what I'm saying? The thing about Christianity is what? Faith. The evidence for what we believe is our faith. It's not, it's not reason, even though we can reason it. Right? And that's why the, the, that's how our, our faith is in text. It is written presented in a body of knowledge so we can reason it. And that's why when we go out to preach to people, we reason with them concerning scriptures on several subjects. We can reason about the kingdom of God. We can reason about judgment. We can reason about sin. We can reason about death. We can reason about all sorts of subjects in the Bible. Okay? So we can present our faith from a very uh, reasonable perspective, a commonsensical argument. And we do that. But you see, all that commonsensical argument sits on one thing, faith. If you believe in your heart, are you following what I'm saying? You know, it starts from there. You believe in your heart, and then what? You confess. What do you confess? What you believe in your heart. Do you see? Everything comes back to what? What is in your heart. And then all the, all the things in your heart are not necessarily informed by logic. Are you following what I'm saying? You just believe what you believe. You know, it's just like when you ask someone, why do you love that person? You know, some people will not have anything to say. Right? Say, I just love him from the depth of my heart. Have you heard people talk like that? And they don't have any cogent reason. You know, some people say, ah, I love his eyes, his legs. Oh, God. But some people don't have those kind of vain excuses, the vain reasons. They just, they, you just love who you love. Period. Why, why, why does God love us? He just loves us because we are an object of his creation. He created us. Are you following what I'm saying? 
And you know, if, if there is someone you should not love, it is human beings. <laughs> if, so, if there is someone you should not love, it is human beings. Because we just know how to mess things up. Are you following what I'm saying now? So, all right. So, so the arguments, even Satan could not take the option of arguing against God to reject God's existence. The Bible says demons, they believe God and they tremble. Do you see that? They believe God and they tremble. Number two, God does not have the final say over creation affairs. You know, I, what you can observe, I'm talking about what you can observe from that interaction between Satan and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. You know, because that conversation, especially from the perspective of, of Satan, seemed to suggest to us that God does not have the final say over creation affairs. Because he says, the woman says, God told us that if we eat of it, we will die. Satan says, you will not surely die. Oh, in other words, what is he saying in essence? God does not have the final say on events. Are you following what I'm saying now? All right. God's position can be questioned. Now, another thing you see there is that, uh, that there are no consequences for contravening God's instruction. That, you know, I'm, I'm telling you what we can see from the interaction of these two people. I'm not telling you facts. Okay? I'm just telling you the, 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 the things we can observe from that interaction between them. Okay? So, we see that there, is not, there will be no consequence. Or there are no consequences uh, for contravening God's instruction. If God says you will die, and Satan came to the woman to say you will not die, what is he saying? Don't worry. Do anything you like. There are No consequences. No consequences. God is just bluffing. Eh? Can somebody really say with all conscience that God is just bluffing? That look, and you just, just imagine. That's why some people say that, you know, and even we, it, maybe, maybe the context is different, but the idea itself to even say things like that is very ridiculous. When, when people say, for instance, you know, and there's a song like, in your presence, anything goes, why would you even say something like that? You know, it's very silly to say something like that. Because in the presence of God, anything does not actually go. So Satan is telling, you know, that, that's the playbook of Satan here. He says, look, you can do what God says not to do. There will be no consequence. Die? Who dies? Have you seen anybody die before? And the truth is that, has the woman seen anybody die before? No. Even animals, has animals died in our presence before? No. Say, die? What do you mean die? Do you know die? Have you seen die before? No. There are no consequences. Eat it. It is meant for you to eat. And then number four, there is a different reality attainable by taking advantage of Eden knowledge. There is a different reality attainable by taking advantage of Eden knowledge. Now, remember the, the, the serpent told the woman that if the day you eat of it, your eyes shall be opened, right? And you shall be like the gods. Oh, so he's saying in a sense that there is a hidden reality behind eating that particular tree. That, that is, the, 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 tree, it, the, the tree is not just enough for food. It is much more than food. It will provide you something bigger than food. You see, you will, your level of reality will be elevated, you will know better than what you know now. So, promising a different reality that is available if you take advantage of, of that stuff. And then number five, another thing we see here is that man's free will is really free. You know, some people, man's free will, our free will to do anything we like is actually free. That is, we have the ability to do anything we like. Human beings does have any. We can do anything we like. So now, you know, when people, when people have done something bad, something evil, they will say, if you do good, you say it is God. Right? And it is true because it is the influence behind it that matters. So God is the influence behind that. But if you do evil, you now say it is the devil. And in a sense, it is true. Because Satan is behind, is the influence behind it. But come to think of it, in that story, did the devil pluck the fruit and put it in her hands? No. The devil only gave her ideas, playing on her lost ideas, 
and then the woman saw. Right? I think that is in verse 6. Genesis 3, 6. The, the woman saw that the tree, the fruit of the tree was good for food. Right? It's good for food. You see that now? And pleasant to the eyes. Is it verse 6? Pleasant to the eyes and desirable to make one wise. And then she what? Took of it and she ate. So two things. She saw, right? And then she took. Did the devil give it to her? Huh? He only gave her ideas. Who acted on it? The woman. In, what am I saying to you in essence? We are free to do what we like. We might have been influenced, but the responsibility is ours. So when you do evil, you are responsible for the evil. Are you following what I'm saying? And when you do good also, you are responsible for the good. So quit you blaming Satan. Quit you blaming Satan. So sin came into the world and then death by sin. That, so I just gave you that to show you how that sin came into the world. You see the interaction? Look at all the things the Satan had to attack for him to be able to make sure the woman fell into sin. Look at it. And then it happened. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. They invited an element that was not present into the world, in the world. They invited it into the world. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Hallelujah. Look at it. It says, by one man, sin entered the world. And death by sin. So how did death come in? Because of sin. How did sin come in? Because of man. Do you see that? Death came, sin came because of man. So death was given a legal foothold in the world. The sin of men gave it power to come into the world. And Adam had children under the sinful regime where death reigned. Are you see that now? So, um, death is a testament that there is sin. You see, death is just the evidence that sin is in the world. That people die. And God did actually say in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, that if they eat it, he says in dying, you will what? Die. Now, that dying... That dying has three elements in it. And I'm going to speak to those three elements tonight um, in a moment. Look at Romans chapter, 5, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come? Is that there? Look at verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Now, what is reigning in the world? Death. Do you follow now? So, that is one of the reigning monarchs. You see, one of the ways that this world is dominated by Satan. In fact, the chief reason is sin. Sin brought death in the world. So, when you see people die, it is to show you the oppression of sin is present in the world. And you hear that practically every day in the news. People die. And that's a constant reminder that sin is in this world. And that the victory is required over death is clear indication that it reigns over people. You know, if in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, from verse 54 to 56, you know, the Bible talks about the victory that we have over death in resurrection. 
when Jesus Christ will raise us or those who are dead in Christ from the dead. And if, God, if he is going to raise them from the dead and he says, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? It shows you that before the victory we have in Christ, death was reigning. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. We are going to read it through to 56. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, look at it, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in what? Victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is what? The law. Can you see that? So, it shows you a victory that is available in Christ in the resurrection over death. 